Okay, so Pi News episode 58, and first up, uh, this has only just come in, and I really like this story. From Tom's Hardware, Raspberry Pi Zero drop-in kit fits inside original Game Boy DMG. The DMG is referring to the model, I had to look this up. Uh, basically, we're talking about the original uh, black and white Game Boy. So if we scroll down, if you're a fan of the original Game Boy DMG, you've got to check out this new drop-in kit from maker Zarcade UK. This custom PCB works with either a Raspberry Pi Zero or Raspberry Pi Zero 2W, settling snugly into the original or reproduction Game Boy shells. I have a Game Boy shell, um, but I'm not going to get it out of this nice packaging. Uh, this was sent to me from XreArt, and I did an unboxing video on it a while ago, but I thought I'd get it out again uh, just to show how small the Zero 2W is next to it. So there's plenty of room in there, and this is what the original board looks like on a Game Boy Color at least and obviously the battery hatch and things like that. But uh, I recently got rid of my uh, Raspberry Pi Zero. I've already got two Zero 2Ws which are much more powerful and pretty much work with everything the same. But uh, you can trade them in for £20 at CEX uh, and I thought it was probably quite a good price so I've traded that in. So if we scroll down uh, just to show you there's some great pictures in here. Uh, this one shows all the bits that come with it so it looks like it would be a pretty easy kit to put together. You can see all these sort of uh, holes for putting through the plastic little bits and the screws and everything. Uh, we can see a speaker, a headphone jack, all sorts of extras. I don't know what this extra picture is. Oh yeah, there's a picture of it slotted in and there's the plastic bits going through. So very, very easy to fit, I would say, looking at this. Yeah, very nice. And uh, I think it's a pretty good price as well. So 38 49 in the UK or $47.21 in the States. And if you haven't got an original Game Boy, they actually sell for quite a low price. I mean, something like this, which uh, needs new screen, sold for 15, well, 18 pound with postage. Uh, I think that's a pretty good price considering how much the board is. If you already have a zero, obviously zeros are quite hard to get hold of, but uh, if you already have a zero, then it's quite a nice cheap way of getting a handheld. According to Zarcade UK, the kit uses a 3.2 inch SPI LCD. So it uses a custom version of RetroPie to resize the video and rotate the image to a portrait output. It includes a speaker for external audio and an audio jack. It relies on a rechargeable battery and has safe shutdown support as well. Uh, but it does mention here because the kit is the original Game Boy, you only have access to uh, two buttons. So we've got start, select, we've got A and B, and we've got up, down and left and right. And I did initially think maybe a Game Boy Advance would be all right, but actually a lot of Game Boy Advance use shoulder buttons. And uh, same with Mega Drive and SNES games, they use three buttons. But it is, it's a really nice project, it's a great idea. And if we have a quick look at the photos, uh, you can see it just slots in. These little plastic bits go through the holes to locate everything in the right place. Yeah, very, very clever. Really like that one. Next up is uh, from Gaming on Linux, the DevGet tool helps Ubuntu and derivative distro fans grab extra apps. So if we scroll down through, uh, basically Martin Wimpress has been uh, the lead on this and uh, he he's done loads on the Raspberry Pi on Ubuntu Mate and got it really working very well on the Raspberry Pi and uh, definitely customized that software. And he's also got loads of videos showing how he's doing it and, and what processes he goes through and getting things to work, really, really interesting. And there's a GitHub for this. He explains like Software Boutique on Ubuntu Mate, which is a way of adding extra software. And this is particularly good if you're using a newer system, because I often find that with the newer uh, versions of Ubuntu, the software isn't always ready for it. So you go to install it and it says there isn't a version. So with this, it's got all the instructions, very, very easy to install. And you can install it like this, sudo deb dash get install Google Chrome stable. Uh, and if we scroll down, there are so many different programs which have already been added to it. So one password, Belena Etcher, Discord, Docker, Dropbox, Google Chrome, Google Earth Pro, Microsoft Edge browser, Plex. Skype, Spotify, all sorts of useful software in there. The list goes on and on. And you can also request things as well. If you want something added, then uh, you can request that on the GitHub. So I'll put a link to that in the description. Next up, Raspberry Pi Pico. I haven't done a lot with my Raspberry Pi Pico because I do less on the sort of maker side of it, but I really do like it as a piece of kit. So this Pico Bricks 
is uh, a way of doing the maker side, but it's more modular. So if we scroll down, those of you looking to learn about electronics or are a STEM educator may be interested in a new modular Raspberry Pi development kit called Pico Bricks. As the name suggests, the modules have been designed to be used with the Raspberry Pi Pico, a tiny microcontroller equipped with the new RP2040 designed in-house by the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So if we scroll down, there's various different pictures of it and you can see that it's more modular, less about running in individual cables and more sort of plugging in these little modules, uh, which must make it much easier. Now if I hit play, and you can always progress to using the cables and things like that at a later time with a different breadboard, but you can see it's like a sort of clock radio system here. Uh, and those are a bit where, yeah, they're piecing it all together. Little screen comes with it, little LED lights and things like that. And uh, it looks pretty robust because in this bit, he's putting it into his bag without any extra casing or anything on it. There you go. Not sure if I'd trust that necessarily, but yeah, really, really nice. Uh, the maker side is a big side on the Pi. I don't really visit enough, but I do mean to do more Pico videos in the future. And a car story next. Uh, so Apple CarPlay is now available for Tesla vehicles. I think this has been around for a while, but I think it's more about an updated version of it, but only for owners willing to resort to a workaround that uses a connected Raspberry Pi. So the workaround involves using a Raspberry Pi with an LTE modem and a Wi-Fi access point running a custom Android-based firmware, as well as a micro HDMI to HDMI cable and Ethernet cable. As demonstrated in this YouTube video, the in-car is used to connect to the Raspberry Pi and display the CarPlay interface on the Tesla screen, where Apple apps, including Maps and Apple Music function as expected. The system works while driving and can be controlled with the media buttons on the Tesla steering wheel. So if you have a Tesla and you don't like the onboard system, then uh, this is possibly a solution for you. And just a quick interruption to Pi News to show one of the best gadgets I've recently bought. Uh, this is a dock for your phone and uh, it's, it just works really nicely so you just drop it in and uh, it, it just grabs it but it grabs it really quite gently and it's got rubber on the sides. But also if you want to watch YouTube while you're sat in your car, obviously not where you're driving, you can flip it over and it holds it in place. It's such a nice dock. And it's got this sort of swivel joint on it. Uh, it's just got, comes with a couple of sticky pads, uh, but also if you don't want to stick anything to your dashboard, it comes with this vent mount with a really strong spring. So you just pop it in the vent, grab it in, and then you've got like a ball and socket joint. Yeah, really nice product. Anyway, back to Pi News. Next up on Facebook, we have uh, a really nice build of a Pi Zero inside an old iPod photo. Uh, and it says here, even the click wheel works. Here is the original project I roughly followed. So there's links in there for that if you plan to do something like this yourself. But if we zoom into it, uh, we can see, yeah, very, very nice. Uh, loads of stuff going on in there. Uh, where is the Pi? There's the Pi. Right, so this is the Pi Zero here, nicely sandwiched in. And there's all these cables and everything going everywhere. Yeah. And if we scroll through, plenty of pictures, which I always like. And here it is, up and running with the software working as well. With Bluetooth headphones, which is something that wouldn't have been around on the original iPod. Yeah, very, very nice. Well done, Vishal. Also from Facebook, uh, this is a really cool looking thing and definitely looks really cool in the video. So uh, from Lee Chan on Raspberry Pi and DIY Projects Facebook group, I build a hexapod robot using Raspberry Pi 02W. It is programmed with Python and I have shared my code on my GitHub page, so there's links in the story. Uh, but if we have a look at the video, uh, it really moves very fast. So you can see there's a couple of them here, but uh, yeah, just it looks a bit <laughs> looks a bit scary in some ways. Look at the movement on it, amazing. And another Facebook, uh, again from Raspberry Pi and DOI projects. Uh, now I think I've talked about this before in a video, but maybe I talked about it in my Pi 400 video. Uh, this is a Pi 4 8 gig running at 2.8 gigahertz. Now I did try the config.txt uh, that was there and I couldn't get it to be stable. It would work, but, um, but it actually wasn't any faster and it wasn't stable. So I'd need to do more speed tests on it. But then I haven't delidded my Pi. I don't know how much difference that actually makes, but um, it's, uh, it's shown in this video. So you actually have to cut all the stuff that's bonding it in place. And uh, it looks like it's done with a modeling knife. Yeah. 
And there's something modular on the GPO pins. I'm not sure what that is. Here we go. Trying to take it off now. Have a look at the Facebook page if you want to see it properly uh, in real time. But let's go back. And this is showing it de-lidded. There we go. It looks like them, some thermal paste going on. And here's Conkey showing the 2.8 gigahertz overclock. Yeah, I've shown this picture before with the overclock settings, but I've actually been given some updated settings on that. So Mads Christensen uh, tried it. This was uh, five days ago in my comments. Tried your extreme 2800 overclock. As it was there, it wasn't stable. I added force turbo equals one, no need for initial turbo equals one, and set the over voltage to 18. It were actual stable. My little Pi, now stronger than my laptop with 1080 long YouTube video. It only drops about one out of 32. It is extreme how far overclocking has gone on the Pi. I remember for a year ago, I couldn't overclock more than 2200 and it didn't boot at all. So if you want to try those overclocking settings, do it all at your own risk, uh, especially if you're de-lidding, you're definitely going to invalidate your warranty. On the subject of overclocking still, uh, I had this comment from Monte. If we go down to the last bit, so I um, misunderstood the question, um, but on the last correspondence, oh no, I didn't explain properly. I mean, literally speaking, my Pi 4 8 gig model cannot be overclocked using anyone's instructions thus far. It's not a matter of bad inputs, kernel panics, or massive voltage jumps. I'm talking the literal form of following the exact instructions verbatim using a Pi 4 8 gig with a day one default OS. There is yet to be a how-to that successfully overclocks an 8 gig model. I'm not sure there is big enough Pi community to notice this yet. Now, I've overclocked my Pi 4 8 gig, well both of them successfully loads of times and I haven't had any issues. Um, but the only thing I could come up with uh, was maybe they bought it second hand and the never underscore over voltage was enabled. Now I don't know a lot about this, I have definitely never done it because I don't know if it's reversible. So if I copy this, oh, in fact, I put a link to the page. So if I control F in this and then search in the page for never underscore over voltage, uh, here you go, sets a bit in the OTP memory, one time programmable that prevents the device from being over voltage. This is intended to lock the device down so the warranty bit cannot be set either inadvertently or maliciously by using an invalid over voltage. So I can only think that it is set in stone because uh, it doesn't give any other way of changing it and I would imagine it doesn't show up in the config.txt after you've done it. Whether someone has tried this, uh, I can understand it in uh, educational departments where someone's trying to overclock a Pi uh, that they shouldn't be and uh, you can imagine someone possibly causing damage. Although that said, every time I've overclocked, I've gone to silly levels and it's always thermal throttled, but then it could shorten the life by running it uh, at a higher voltage. So uh, yeah, let me know what your thoughts are on that if you've got any other ideas. Um, so the comment was on this video, so overclocking 8 gig Raspberry Pi 4 running stable at 2147. So if you do a search for that, it's the most recent comment. Have a look through the thread. And if you've got anything to share, that would be interesting. I have to say it is one of the greatest things about the Raspberry Pi, the documentation, especially nowadays. This newer one that got added a while back uh, is completely searchable and it's incredible how much you can change on a Pi. And next up was this story from makeuseof.com and it's comparing a mini PC, a bit like my Melee mini PC, which is a silent computer running Intel, uh, comparing it to a Raspberry Pi 4. And uh, one of the big things in the story definitely was talking about energy. And with energy prices massively rising, it will be interesting to see how much my son's i7 uh, with big graphics card computer and dual monitor setup uses compared to my Pi. It's a nice balanced story. Um, I thought it was fair to all technologies really. Um, you know, traditional desktop PCs can use a huge amount of electricity. And definitely people have mentioned this in the comments more recently that they have switched over to a Pi because it is so much cheaper to run from an electricity point of view. And uh, it also mentions the M1 Mac as well. Um, and uh, comes up with some of the shortcomings of the Pi, which is, is pretty agreeable. You know, it isn't as easy to get certain things working. But uh, yeah, so I like the article, so I'll put a link in the description to that. Uh, I've been thinking about power a lot recently. Uh, I recently got a second-hand electric car, and so I've been thinking about kilowatts. I've got a smart meter coming uh, this week. I think Thursday it's arriving. And uh, so I've been reading a lot about kilowatts and what various devices use. And recently in the press, um, there was a story about um, microwaves using huge amounts of power when they're on standby. And I was thinking, well, this 
how can this be true? And this thread, which I'll also put a link in the description, is really interesting because at the end of it, it isn't 70 watts. So the meter that's reading it is giving an incorrect meeting. So this is why I've kind of avoided showing what power a Pi uses compared to some other devices, although I would definitely like to do it. But maybe when I've got my smart meter, it will be an easier thing to test and also maybe compare it to my, to my son's computer. Um, but uh, yeah, if you go through it, uh, right near the end, uh, someone gets a smart meter, turns everything off in the house, only turns on the, uh, the the microwave and it's nowhere near the 70 watts that it's reporting uh, so i mean 70 watt uh, is would be using huge amounts of power and my electricity has gone up to 28p per kilowatt hour uh, it used to be 22p but i'm going to switch to a tariff which will give me 8p between 12:30 and 4:30, and i'm going to use as much on that so charging devices charging the car heating the water all of that sort of stuff and it will end up being cheaper but uh, not as cheap as some countries so libya is 0 0.007 cents uh, for a kilowatt hour of electricity which is incredibly cheap i mean obviously libya is oil rich so it isn't the cleanest of energy it's not like it's solar or or wind generated but um, yeah it's uh, and and seeing how expensive it can be in some of these uh, some of these islands it could be more although the UK and I think Germany is one of the highest in Europe um, but uh, yeah just it, I, I think it's an interesting thing and I've read a lot about it recently next up uh, we've got a website change from the WOR project so it's now WORproject.com it used to be .org I think um, but they've basically moved the website and uh, I've updated my most recent tutorials on my most recent Windows 10 videos and 11 videos. But uh, yeah, that's, that's where you'll find that now. And last up is a Cyberdeck, very nice looking one. So if I click on this, in fact, I need to rotate this. Hey Pi, rotate left. Okay, it's done. And this is a very nice looking Cyberdeck. Uh, you can see it's got the, uh, the top screen here and also the side touch screen with a, a very fancy looking button as well. Obviously a Pi 400 in there, so performance is good. It's not going to affect calling too much. Actually, no, it, put, it calls at the back. So it'll be interesting to see what they've done uh, with calling at the back of that. Obviously, it's got the heatsink on the top, but it does have vents as well. But the Pi 400 is, is great at auto cooling. Yeah, there's a nice image of it. And if we scroll down, inspired by Mac Magic Bar and the Asus Zen notebooks, always want the keyboard that could take away some of the nonsense on my screens and a pre-configured shortcuts and so forth based off a Raspberry Pi 400. It has a five inch multi-touch display, has a trackpad and a 7.9 inch multi-touch bar with an R503 biometric sensor. The whole case was designed in F360 and printed on my Ender 3 Pro V2. It has eight pieces which screw together. Yeah, very nice looking. Okay, so I hope all this helps. Thanks very much for watching. Please like and subscribe.